Hey, what's up guys, John here. Over the last couple of years, everyone wanted to invest in real estate. Whether it be Airbnb, whether it be house flipping or house hacking or buying multifamily, people were investing in syndications or starting their own syndications, raising money. It was just a gold rush. When you look at what happened, I mean, it was unreal. Interest rates were basically zero. There was unlimited money. People were moving from expensive cities. They were willing to overpay for property. There was a very tight supply of available housing. I mean, it was the perfect, perfect moment but all that's now changing. And I believe what we're gonna to start to see here, and we're already seeing it, is that inflation is now being blamed on property owners and investors. Inflation, they say, is the number one problem, the number one enemy that we have to overcome. And when we look at these new housing bills, we look at these new regulations, these new restrictions, I'm not saying that real estate is a bad investment. I think real estate is an incredible investment. I think it's where most people create their wealth, and it's a great way in which you can provide for yourself and your family for generations to come. But you do have to pay very close attention to what's going on right now. This relationship between property owners, tenants, and government has changed over the last couple of years, and it's about to get much, much, much worse. So prepare for this, position yourself for it, and you should be able to weather the storm. Take a look at this. So for, and first and foremost, hit the like button, hit the like button, YouTube's gonna share the content to educate more people that are just simply asleep. And then also, if you wanna fix your credit, we'd love to help you at greatcreditfast.com. That's greatcreditfast.com. Now for people that are not in real estate, how people invest in real estate, multifamily, commercial, they generally buy buildings based on the income, whether it be they're buying it to create value, meaning they want to fix it up and increase the rent, and when they increase the rent, the value is going to increase and they can make you know money that way, or they're going to buy a stabilized asset. Maybe they have a property and they just want a 1031 exchange, meaning they roll the profits from this building, they roll it into a new deal, which is a non-taxable event. They can defer the gains to the future, and then they get this return. Now, in Los Angeles, the average return is a 3.9% return, meaning if it's a million dollar property, it will be generating $39,000 a year. So it's net operating income divided by purchase price. So you take the gross revenue minus your expenses, you'll get your net revenue, and you take that net revenue, annual net revenue, divided by the purchase price will give you a cap rate. Now, if you're in Santa Monica or Venice Beach or Manhattan, one of these areas where it's in high demand, the cap rate, the return is going to be much smaller because you're going to get a very high quality tenant and you have a higher chance of asset appreciation. It's less headache to deal with generally in these prime areas. So you end up getting a less return. But if you go to an area that is full of crime, much risky, much more risky, uh, you're going to get a bigger return, right? You're going to get an 8% or a 9% or a 7% cap rate. So, you know, it, it changes, but that's the overall view. But look at Los Angeles. And of course, that doesn't um, that doesn't factor in for capex or um, any complex uh, equations. It's just a ten thousand foot overview for people that aren't in real estate. So a three point nine percent cap rate, right? Well, rents dropped in Los Angeles one point six percent last year. So you take that into consideration. Rents dropped one point six percent. People are buying three point nine caps. Uh, mortgage rates jump from three percent to seven percent, like we've discussed. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm going to get into something big here, but I'm going to build up this story first. So insurance, insurance in California between 5.6% and 7%. So about 20% bump in insurance cost over the last three years. Now in California, 1.5 million renters are behind on rent, a big number. Nationwide, it's about 8 million. So, I mean, you're talking about 20% of all renters nationwide are in California that are not paying rent. Now, if you look at what Jerome Powell is saying, if you look at what Biden and everyone's saying, Janet Yellen, they're saying that inflation is the enemy and we need to combat inflation. But they're saying 70% of shelter, of inflation is shelter costs right now. So what are they saying? They're saying that for us to really beat inflation, we need to comp, we really need to hit the source, right? They're not talking about some of these policies that implemented or the way in which they took things the last couple of years that are the real reason of inflation. Uh, but they're saying that property owners are. But if you think about this, the more that they push forward on property owners and the more that they go after them, the more power and authority that they have over you and everyone else, right? So this is going to be the target the next couple of years is going to be property owners. Now, this article came up in The Guardian. It says, return of rent control, how some U.S. cities are trying to keep roofs over people's heads. I mean... These are the cities that they're talking about this right now. It says earlier this year, in response to the city's affordability, affordable housing crisis, Boston City Council voted to introduce measures that would stabilize rents. Now you think about this. How can they stabilize rents if they're going to increase insurance, if they're going to increase property taxes, if they're going to increase the cost of these property owners, 
and they have more and more tenants that are falling behind on rent. How can they cap their income? Now imagine if you were to go buy a Starbucks a couple years ago when it was five bucks, and now you go in and get it at seven, at seven bucks, maybe the beans went increase maybe their labor increase maybe you know maybe a variety of different things changed and they had to increase their cost but at the end of the day the cu the customer the consumer has the option of either buying it or not buying it right well when they start to do this and they start putting these caps on and they increase these interest rates what they're ultimately doing is limiting the ability for an investor to get their money out of the building because they're slowly pulling the equity out as interest rates rise and so they're drowning these property owners. We're not, we're not pointing the finger at insurance companies. We're not doing it at the Starbucks. We're not doing it at the Whole Foods or any of these other companies. It's just the property owners and it's an agenda. It's a really, really big agenda. Look at this, landlords in panic mode about last minute Albany bill. This is absolutely insane. I read this article, I, I couldn't believe it. So Chip claims that the bill seeks to unravel a landmark 2020 state court appeals decision along with subsequent rulings. The 2020 case found that in 2019 rent law could not be applied retroactively to rent overcharge cases. So what is rent control? Because this is gonna be something that is gonna to start to really spread. It was initially just California, New York, maybe a couple other little areas, but I think it's going to continue to spread uh, to a lot of cities, a lot of these big, big cities that already have policies that are touching this. Uh, I think that they're gonna to start to spread into rent control. And what this essentially does, it turns the landlord into essentially a property manager for the city, where the landlord is only allowed to increase rents a certain amount, they have to abide by certain laws, they have to abide by certain guidelines by the city, and these guidelines consistently change. So if they have to move into these guidelines, they make the guidelines more and more radical and more and more insane as the years go. Now, what they're saying here in Albany is that it says that it is also determined that if rent owed the tenants in overcharge cases, uh, predicated to 2019 law can be calculated based on a four year look back. So they're saying, if you increase your rent past a certain point that we deem as predatory, they're gonna have a four year look back period. The landlord scheme and saying that you basically illegally scheme to deregulate your units and basically make profit on them. In those cases, if the tenant had evidence of fraud, they could consult rental history beyond the usual four years before the complaint. If it is determined that fraud occurred, the overcharge is calculated using a default formula, which relies on the lowest stabilized rent recovered for comparable apartments rather than determining the base rent of a four year look back period. So then they start to look around in the entire neighborhood. They find a apartment, the lowest one, and they say this is where the rent should be. And they look at the spread between what that unit rented for and what they were paying. And then they take this big number and then they put it in front of the landlord to pay it, plus all the fines uh, mandated and issued by the city. Uh, the measure defines fraud as a material breach of any duty to disclose truthfully the rent, regulatory status, or lease information in order to deregulate or unlawfully increase the rent whether or not the fraud was intentional or regardless of whether a tenant specifically relied on truthful misleading statements in registrations, leases, or other documents. Now in Los Angeles, what they were doing before was that a landlord would have to tell the city what they were charging for rent. Now, what the city's doing is actually calling the tenants and verifying how much the tenant's paying and then matching it to what the landlord says that they're generating. So they're really, really, really getting on top of these landlords, getting on top of these property owners. Um, I mean, this is, I'm gonna leave this article below because this is, uh, this is shocking. This is what they're really pushing forward to and why they love this so much, why these uh, tenant advocacy networks love it is because, I mean, if you're gonna sue somebody, if you're gonna pursue somebody, you're gonna pursue the ones that have money, right? And it's general knowledge that people that have money own properties. And so these tenant advocacy networks, they go around, they're gonna start hunting, almost like ambulance chasers on a lot of these property owners. Uh, now this is Albany. Albany is you know, obviously much more extreme than a lot of other areas. So I'm not saying this is gonna happen everywhere, but what I'm simply saying is that the dynamic and the relationship between landlord, government, and tenant is changing and it's changing very, very quickly. And I think that this is also going to allow an opportunity for these large private equity investors to step forward and to get a piece of this action. Like for example, Blackstone, one of the largest single family operators in America, and the largest commercial real estate owner in America, they just raised this $30 billion uh, real estate fund, $30 billion, $400 million real estate fund, primarily focused on single family houses 
uh, data centers, and hospitality. And the CEO of the real estate division said, we think that there's a real opportunity to deploy more capital. I think the private credit area is a really golden moment because we do see tightening out there for a liquid world of private capital, which provides debt for commercial real estate projects and that of private equity, the recent upheaval of the U.S. regional banking sector and issuing plaguing downturn office space has sparked questions surrounding the type of, of return CRA, commercial real estate, can generate for investors. So if you look at this, you have increased insurance costs, increased borrowing costs, increased regulation, and you have a situation in which a lot of people thought that they were, they were in the perfect opportunity to pull money out of the properties because of these low interest rates. But now these people are going to have to refinance. And if they're refinancing into a completely different type of uh, valuation on their property, many people might not be able to refi. So I think what we're going to start to see here is an opportunity where private equity is going to step forward and look to seize uh, thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of properties in nearly every city in America. It says we're in a meaningful period of dislocation, says the CEO. Uh, Chief Executive Officer of Morgan Stanley Real Estate Investment, the head of MSREI Americas. During a Commercial Observer Forum in late April, we are seeing risk and asset values being repriced before our eyes. That's exactly it. The last couple of years, people thought there was no risk, right? The only risk was inflation. And I think that's true across the entire investable universe and certainly across private real estate, every sector, virtually every global market. The dislocation across markets and asset classes has been driven by numerous external factors, including secular shift in office usage since that. But the largest reason for the distress has been the historically rapid interest rates rise by the Federal Reserve. Those have caused asset values to decline as borrowing costs have spiked. The increased leverage ratios on existing loans have put pressure on borrowers and in some circumstances made it impossible to keep loans current or refinance maturing loans without the infusion of equity. Moreover, the cost of financing acquisitions or new developments has also skyrocketed, creating a pause in equity markets. Now look at some of these deals that have happened just, I mean, some of these deals that have been lost just over the last you know, couple months. You have Brookfield, $784 million in loans, lost. Uh, Blackstone sent $270 million uh, to resurfacing, special servicing, in February. $130 million mortgage here. Uh, this one is $260 million. We're, I mean, right here. It says this is going to be the biggest opportunity since the Great Recession. More distress since the Great Recession. So this is what I think is going to happen. I believe over the next you know, year or so, the relationship is going to get much, much more rugged and much tougher between landlord and tenant in most areas. Now, I do love Florida. I love Texas, uh, how these markets are operating for property owners. Do I think that those markets are going to be hit as hard? I mean, maybe not in the short term. I think in the long term, though, I think all states are going to be moving in this direction. And now many people might be like, John, in no way. It's not moving in that direction. The reason I say this is if you were to tell me two years ago, three years ago, four years ago that I would have agreed with you. But if you look at what's going on right now in MiamiDade.gov, you go to the website, you look at it, they're following the same exact blueprint for clean energy and these property upgrades as New York City. The same exact one. If you look at Texas, they're talking a lot about the same exact thing. So the dynamics are very similar. Some states are just moving faster than others. I do think there's going to be incredible opportunities to make money in real estate. I just think that you know you got to know your stuff. You got to really follow what's going on. You have to have a really, really good game plan. Pay very, very close attention to what's going out there or going on out there because I do think that we're going to see some really big curveballs coming to this market that a lot of people simply would call impossible. But if you look at the last couple of years, you probably would have in 2018, 2019, you would have said the next five years would be impossible. But here we are. I'm telling you, the next three years are going to probably be a hell of a lot crazier than the past three years. What do you think about it? Drop below, hit the like button, subscribe here. Uh, add me on IG for uh, content you're not going to get here. And I respond to DMs over there. And again, if you need help fixing your credit, we'd love to help you at greatcreditfast.com. Catch you guys in the next one.